But what are the interosseous muscles doing, particularly during finger flexion? Now, we're going to look a little bit at interosseous muscles, but in the next course, we specifically are going to look at them in much greater depth. It is not unusual that there are multiple insertions of the interosseous muscles, and keep in mind that the in, these insertions are shared with insertions into the capsule. So there's only proximal and distal motion here. There's no dorsal or volar motion of any of these insertions. Salisbury told us that every interosseous muscle is able to act on the proximal phalanx regardless of its direct attachment to it. Now we commonly think of the interosseous muscles as the prime muscles that spread our fingers and bring our fingers together. But I think we undervalue the importance of the interosseous muscles in flexing the metacarpal phalangeal joint. Yes, flexion I would place at the top as one of the primary motions at the MP joint. Certainly, they also ab and adduct the fingers. The interosseous muscles are also responsible for, for rotation of the fingers. That will be discussed in greater depth in our next course. And at the IP joints, these interosseous muscles contribute to the dorsal apparatus and do also then provide interphalangeal joint extension, whether through the central slip insertion or the oblique fibers or the lateral band. As we previously said, MP joint flexion counteracts the extensor digitorum communis power, and IP joint extension counteracts the power of the extrinsic flexors. In both circumstances at the MP and the interphalangeal joints. One direction is primary with an extrinsic and the other direction is primary with intrinsic muscles. This is true of both of the joints. They happen to be opposite directions. So if I'm thinking about the interosseous muscles, again the dominance in the transverse fibers and the oblique fibers, I would draw solid lines. I would draw a thicker line here secondarily because there's only an interosseous muscle here versus here there's also a lumbrical sharing some of the power. And there's also interconnections via the conjoined lateral bands. If we look at the extent of the blue in this drawing, and we compare it back to the extent of red when we were talking about the extensor digitorum communis, it becomes fairly easily to schematically see the difference between the influence of the interosseous muscles on finger motion versus the influence of the extensor digitorum communis. As we have said, the interosseous muscles are primarily responsible for MP joint flexion. Brand and Hollister tell us that although these muscles have smaller moment arms than the lumbrical muscles, they have much more power and, and provide tension and therefore they are more important MP joint flexors than are the lumbrical muscles. We see this here. The transverse fibers are the interosseous. They receive the interosseous insertion. They're closer to the axis of the joint than the lumbrical muscle. And we assume that the longer moment R is more mechanically effective. But in this case that is not true because the interosseous muscles are so much more powerful than the lumbrical muscles, they provide much greater power even though they have a shorter moment arm. The interosseous muscles have a shorter fiber length compared to the lumbrical and therefore they have limited excursion and velocity, but they have a large cross-section area which means that they can generate a much greater isometric muscle force or power. When the metacarpal phalangeal joint is in full extension, the interosseous muscles cannot initiate flexion. 
The reason they cannot initiate flexion is that the transverse fibers, which receive the contraction and are the MP joint flexors, are not at a good angle to provide power for flexion. As we know, the power would be transmitted more distally with interosseous muscle contraction when the MP joint is extended. But IP joint extension, represented here, transverse fibers, oblique fibers, and the contribution of the interosseous. Valentin says that the interossei can extend the middle and distal phalanges only when the MP joint is extended, allowing proximal glide of what he calls the extensor hood. It is true that when the MP joint is extended, that the more direct line of pull is directed distally. Therefore, in my opinion, the interosseous muscles are more active for interphalangeal joint extension when the MP joint is in extension. Another way to look at this is Smith pointing out that both the central slip and the oblique fibers extend the PIP joint and the lateral bands with the contribution of the conjoined lateral bands, which is also central slip power, extend the DIP joint. But we cannot forget that they never work in isolation. They always work together. The interosseous muscles have often been called the reserve extensors of the interphalangeal joints. In other words, they are not the primary extensors because they're reinforcing what the lumbrical is doing. It's as if they're an assistance to the lumbrical. But if resistance is provided, they then come up to the plate and provide more power. Now let's talk a little bit about abduction and adduction at the MP joint, which we know is the responsibility of the interosseous muscles. When we look at the dorsal interosseous muscles, which are the AB ductors, and the volar interosseous muscles, which are the adductors, we do clearly envision the ease with which they are able to accomplish this motion. This motion, however, only occurs in full extension. When the MP joint is flexed, there is no rotation or abduction adduction. Now here, we're looking at the dorsal interosseous muscle, which has two bellies. It has this dorsal belly, and it has a volar belly. To create confusion, they cross over, and the volar belly actually inserts more dorsally than does the dorsal belly. You can appreciate that the volar belly ends just distal to the metacarpal phalangeal joint thus being a pure abductor. But the dorsal belly, although it goes volarly and then inserts more dorsally, influences the entire dorsal apparatus, which includes metacarpal phalangeal joint flexion and interphalangeal joint extension. You could use a schematic drawing to illustrate it this way. The dorsal belly you see has an influence throughout the dorsal apparatus and the volar belly's influence is limited and stops just distal to the metacarpal phalangeal joint. Another way to think about it is the volar belly of the dorsal interosseous muscles is a pure abductor, but the dorsal belly may contribute to abduction but also plays an important role in interphalangeal joint extension and MP joint flexion. We know that the dorsal interosseous muscles are responsible for abduction, but they have both a bony insertion as well as a separate insertion into the dorsal apparatus. So they are not all pure abductors. Now, if we look at the volar interosseous muscles, we see that there are absolutely no bony insertions. All of the volar interosseous muscles insert into the dorsal apparatus. Therefore, it would be correct to say the volar interosseous muscles are not 
pure adductors because they cannot only adduct. They adduct at the same time they're influencing the dorsal apparatus. We see this clearly in this synergistic adduction if we cup our hand together and we adduct our fingers. During flexion, we normally have some adduction anyway because of the configuration of the collateral ligaments at the MP joints bring our fingers into adduction. So when we're extending and adducting, we are using those volar interosseous muscles. The dorsal and the volar interosseous muscles, however, when we talk about MP joint rotation, must be considered as working jointly. When we grip an object, such as a small ball, the proximal phalanx rotates and accommodates the shape of the object. So when the MP joints start to flex, and the interosseous muscles now have an increasingly difficult time being ab or adductors, they now become rotators. This incredible, finely balanced ability to rotate is what allows the human hand to accomplish very fine motor activities. The microsurgeon is constantly rotating the proximal phalanx to assure the tip of the finger is in exactly the right posture to accomplish whatever small motion is needed. This is a schematic drawing redrawn and it shows that the interosseous pull on either side is what is creating the rotation in one direction from another. Keep in mind that the MP joint needs to be flexed for this to occur. It doesn't have to be fully flexed. It only has to be somewhat flexed. So how would we describe normal interosseous muscle function? We're going to look again at the schematic drawing focusing on the blue areas as representing interosseous muscle function primary for MP joint flexion is the transverse fibers who accept the direct contraction from the interosseous muscle. The oblique fibers are not in a position to accept as direct a line of pull, although they are also active. Secondary are the oblique fibers that contribute to PIP and also DIP extension. The oblique fibers affect movement in the entire dorsal apparatus, which is the primary way in which they then affect movement at the DIP joint. However, if the metacarpal phalangeal joint is in extension, we've learned that the direct line of pull of the interosseous muscles is toward the oblique fibers rather than the transverse fibers. Therefore, when the MP joint is extended, the oblique fibers are more primary. Secondary are the lateral band fibers or the contribution to the DIP joint that is directly from the interosseous. It is there, but it is secondary. We discussed that the sagittal band fibers prevent excessive MP hyperextension. But what actively prevents MP hyperextension? You recall early on we talked about the normal viscoelastic quality of muscles, even in their resting state. Tension in the interosseous muscles, in my opinion, are just enough to provide some tension to counteract MP joint hyperextension in the normal finger because in the normal finger we're not excessive in the hyperextension power. The interosseous are there balancing that out even though they're not necessarily strongly actively contracting. But in this position the interosseous cannot be effective 
extending the IP joints because everything in the dorsal apparatus has moved as far proximal as it can and this muscle contraction pulling into the oblique fibers is not powerful enough to pull the dorsal apparatus even further proximally. So the interosseous muscle cannot mechanically be effective to extend the IP joints when the MP joint is hyperextended. During normal finger flexion, the interosseous muscles are not strongly active until you get to the very end of finger flexion and you want to grip with some power. Do this yourself. Place one finger inside your hand and squeeze your own finger. When you go down into maximum flexion and you're really squeezing, is it tension at the DIP joint that you feel most or do you feel yourself pulling the proximal phalanx into flexion in order to squeeze? That pull you feel for MP flexion are the interosseous muscles pulling. That's exactly what's happening. So the interosseous muscles via the transverse fibers have a significant contribution to powerful grip. We know a patient who has ulnar palsy and the interosseous muscles are absent has an extremely weak grip even though the extrinsic flexors are still normal. The secondary function of the interosseous muscles during normal finger flexion is elongation. The oblique fibers during finger flexion have no tension and these fibers must move distal as finger flexion occurs. This is very confusing and somewhat uh, complex because think about it, these transverse fibers could be firing for MP flexion and at the same time the adjacent fibers have to elongate. This alone suggests that the muscles themselves have to be very complex in their response to this need for differential tension. Just a reminder that the role of the interosseous muscles, in other words, whether they are primary, primarily affecting tension in the transverse or oblique fibers, is dependent upon the position of the metacarpophalangeal joint. 